know, uh, let's do our chamfer with the two plane. Something like that. So, a couple of things happen with a chamfer. One is, you cut away your reference points. So unless you do a preoperative putty matrix, which you can do, and in fact when you take the board exam, that's what you do, so that the examiners can assess your preparation, you simply make a cross section through that and then you can go in with a perio probe and see that you're reduced the, the proper amount all the way around the tooth. We don't teach you that method, not because it isn't a good method, but it's not real practical. Uh, you're not gonna be doing that with every crown preparation that you do. You're just gonna go in and you're gonna prepare the tooth and you're gonna prepare it based upon this image you've built into your mind of what the ideal preparation looks like. And hopefully by practicing on these type of teeth, you get a pretty good feel for what your preparation looks like. Even though every tooth you prepare is gonna be unique, you kind of know what a what a full zirconia crown for an upper molar looks like, or a lower molar looks like. So with that in mind, with your rounded shoulder margin, you, you were able to, you know, it's kind of like this, right? And you could put your perio probe in, right up by the margin, and you could measure how deep it was at the margin. It's pretty easy to do because it's a rounded shoulder margin and you can measure it very close to the margin. Well, with the chamfer, you've got this long slope, this long sloping margin that not only changes as you go more occlusal, but this changes out here that you just cut away. <laughs> so by the time you get to an axial wall, you may be clear up in this area. And now if you put your perio probe in, well, okay, I think we've got an axial wall here, but um, my reference is not where the margin is. It's out maybe a half millimeter. You've just cut that off. So how do you measure? You do it with your eyes, <laughs> pretty much. And, and you, you need to get good with looking at shapes and having an idea, is that about a half millimeter? Is that about a millimeter? Um, so that you, you know what, because the, the criteria on this preparation are what, what is the, the target depth on your chamfer margin? It's one millimeter, isn't it? And so on the assessment form, we give you 0.75 to 1.25. It, it's a half millimeter range, which is pretty broad. We just want you to fall in that range where it's about three quarters of a millimeter up to maybe a millimeter and a quarter. So we want you to aim for a millimeter. And if you look at the assessment, that's the broadest category, the sweet spot of all the other categories. If you start under reducing, it goes by quarter millimeter increments. If you over reduce, it goes by quarter millimeter increments. So we get it that it's hard to measure that. Uh, and we're not gonna measure it with a perio probe either. We're gonna look at it and say, does that look right? Does that look like that's about a one millimeter chamfer margin? If you look at the burrs that are designed to do chamfers, they start with this, at least Brassler does, 6878K, and then there's, there's an 012, and it, you have one of these in your burr block, and it's really narrow. It's the narrowest diameter chamfer diamond I believe Brassler makes. They do make an 014, we don't put it on the burr block, just because we have to limit it somewhere. They make an 016, we don't put that one on the bird block either, but it's, avail it, it's available to you uh, over on the card. So you can use an 016, and what's the advantage of the 016? Well, 
It's a little smaller diameter than the one that's on your burr block, which is an 018. And so interproximally, if you want to drop it down to an 016, it, makes, it gives you just a little bit more room. All of the preparations that I've done, that I show you, I do them with the 018 only. So you can do everything, including interproximal, with the 018. Brassler even makes an 021. That's huge. That would obviously be too big. Um, you could use it buccal and lingual, but you couldn't use it in approximately in most cases. So on your Burbach, we put an 018, which is big enough that it's pretty efficient. The bigger the diameter, the more efficient the burr is going to be. And so the more of the preparation that you can do with this larger diameter, the faster it's going to cut. So the 012, again, that's a, that's a big, big burr. And, and so on. The 016 and the 014 are somewhere in between the 018 and the 012. You could prepare a chamfer margin with any one of these because you're using the tip of the diamond. So the 018 at the tip, the radius, does anybody remember what it is? It's 0.6. So the diameter at the tip is 1.2, but you're only, you're only using half of it, right? So even with the diamond, this fat 018, you're not going to be able to get to the depth of one millimeter without walking the burr, and for lack of a better term, up the, up the axial wall a little bit. So with your 018, you're going to be about like this. Does that make sense? It won't, it won't prepare the entire depth. It's not a big enough burr in diameter to do that. So the way you do it is you simply move it down the wall as you're doing the preparation, as you're going deeper. So it's a whole different technique than we use with the rounded shoulder torpedo burr, right? And then refining the margin becomes very easy. Sometimes we just take the tip of that burr and just bring it outside the tooth slightly and swipe it across it and it creates a real smooth margin. If you have any J-lips, it'll get rid of them really quickly. So why do we use, why do we even have a chamfer diamond? Why do we do chamfer preparations rather than rounded shoulder for everything? Any thoughts? That's one reason right there. You're absolutely spot on. A shoulder margin is deeper in the cervical region of the tooth and it's more aggressive. So good point. But I'll tell you what the, oh yeah. I would, uh, if there's a lack of tooth structure that you're able to put the whole shoulder on. Yeah. So the chamfer is a little easier that way, isn't it? You're absolutely right. I'll tell you the main reason we do is they're easier. They're just a little easier. They're more user friendly for most of us to do a chamfer preparation. Now you couldn't do a chamfer margin with a glass ceramic like lithium disilicate. It's not strong enough. You, you could bond it. You could do that if you wanted to, but then that also adds complexity to the procedure. But the high strength zirconias, the crystalline ceramics, you can, you can get away with the chamfer margin. And the chamfer margin is the margin that we use for all of the metallic restoration. So anything that's cast metal, cast gold, gold alloys, porcelain fused to metal, we do a chamfer preparation with. It, it's either that or it's a shoulder with a bevel, which we'll go into in more detail later. But the other thing that is difficult, and that's why we don't precisely measure this, is, okay, let's say we decided to put a probe in, we found, we got off the slope, and we came up onto the axial wall. Well, if you happen to look down on your probe, let's say here's, here's a millimeter, here's two millimeters, 
Well, if the observer's eyes were about right here, that would look like about a one millimeter chamfer, wouldn't it? But if the observer was over here, it would look like it was about a one and a half or two millimeter chamfer. And so just where you are when you're looking down the axis of the preparation and trying to measure that makes a difference as well. So you can't precisely measure a chamfer margin depth without making a preoperative matrix, a reduction guide that you can measure from. And that's okay if you want to do that, but we're not going to be assessing them that way. We're giving you a half millimeter range that we want you to be within on the depth of your chamfer. And you can look at the examples that we've given you. That's, uh, I think the one I have is probably a light one millimeter. It would maybe be just under one millimeter, but it's deep enough. It's in that zone where it's gonna be just fine. Uh, there's no reason to go really deep with these. Uh, when you do go deep, you're actually, you're taking a lot of tooth structure off when you are up in the, you know, gingival third of the tooth there because of the height of contour. So, again, as I mentioned before, you could do a chamfer preparation with this 012, and you could take it as deep as you'd go for a PFM, which is 1.2 to 1.7, but you'd be walking that little teeny burr all the way up that margin, it would take you a long time and it would be very difficult. So you want to use the largest burr that you can use and you will be taking it up the axial wall. You won't be able to keep it right down at the margin to do your preparation. So any questions, any doctors, anything else you'd add on the chamfer? I had a question. Yes. Yeah, it, it doesn't. In fact, a more aesthetic margin when we're dealing with porcelain fused to metal and, and even all, all ceramic, because we can keep the restorative material deeper right at the margin, it's actually not as aesthetic as going to a rounded shoulder. It's a convenience. The chamfer is a fairly convenient margin to create. And we use it, it's it kind of out of tradition too. We use the chamfer margin for all of our cast metal for years and years and years. And fortunately, zirconia is strong enough that it, it does great with the chamfer. So, anything I've missed, doctors? Other questions? Are you going to talk about the two planes? Two planes oh, yeah, while we're at it, let's do talk about the two plane. Thank you. Please, yes. Right. It's not so much because you're going to have a hard line with either margin, but oftentimes with, uh, and this isn't in every single case, but if you had a really dark tooth underneath, let's say it was dark, dark tooth structure, the tooth had been endodontically treated 20 years ago with a silver point, and sometimes those roots are dark and you're trying to mask that with your indirect restoration, the more room you give your ceramist right up by the margin, by the gum line, the more depth they have to block out that dark roof, the more effective they're going to be at, at, at covering it. So it's more about masking things we don't want to see than it is about creating like, like with composites where, yeah, a, a beveled margin is a, is a nice margin. It creates a transition. Yeah, this is more where we're trying to block things out. So, yeah, good question. Good, yes, Dr. Fatsnager. Do you recommend the rounded shoulder? Only when you're doing lithium disilicate restorations. And, and you can use the rounded shoulder, and some dentists are really good at it. Just don't J-lip it. You do have to watch out for J-lips. It's a harder preparation to master than the chamfer is. The chamfer, for most of us, is a little bit easier, a little bit quicker. 
Uh, doctors, you have preferences. I mean, even amongst us, you're going to find, and that's why we show you both ways of doing it. So any, any preference, strong preference, one way or another? So don't speak of one. No, there isn't. So they'll, they'll use either margin probably interchangeably a lot. But if you're all ceramic, glassy ceramic, you'll probably go to a rounded shoulder. Um, but, but I would say all of us use both. I do chamfer probably quite a bit more frequently, especially if I'm zirconian or metal. It's a chamfer. Anything else on that? So I just wanted you to kind of get a feel for the chamfer margin. Hopefully that helps. Lots of different burrs you could do it with. Use the largest one. It's going to be the most efficient at preparing that axial wall. Two-plane facial reduction, which we've introduced now. And you're going to be using that technique on pretty much every upper tooth preparation you'll be doing. On a lower posterior tooth, the functional cusp bevel takes care of it. It takes care of the contours on that functional cusp. On an upper tooth, well, we've got our functional cusp over here. The functional cusp bevel does help us out, but oftentimes, depending upon the axis of the preparation, we have to add a second plane of facial axial reduction in order to get enough space for our restorative material. Now, if the axis of our preparation was more lingualized, more, more towards the palate, you might not need that. Does that make sense? If the axis of the preparation on this tooth was a little bit more like this, Down. I'll have to do it now. So if it was a little bit more like this. One of two things is going to happen. I may over taper it a little bit to get the clearance over here, to get the space. But if the axis is simply more to the lingual, I may not need to do two-plane facial reduction. But remember, with most of these teeth, your axis is to the buckle a little bit because of the curve of Wilson. With that, you'll most likely need to do two-plane facial reduction to give yourself enough room for the restorative material. If you do it, if you use that two-plane, the division or the junction is approximately gingival third to occlusal two thirds. That's where the angle change is. You don't want to make the angle change down here near the occlusal aspect. It doesn't help you with the contours. In other words, you wouldn't want to do the two plane facial like this. Does that help? You want it that that, that junction where, it, where the plane changes is going to be very close to the junction between, between the gingival third and the middle third. Yes? So then our taper is measured around the, the gingival third. Yes, the, the, exactly. And that's a good point, is we're not measuring taper between this wall and this wall. We're measuring your taper up here. Does this have an effect on resistance and retention? Absolutely. But for that, for that category on your preparation of taper, axial wall taper, we're going to be looking at this wall with this wall. If you don't do two-plane facial reduction, it forces you to either move your axis to the lingual or to over-taper your preparation. If you do the two-plane facial reduction, you maintain more resistance and retention form in your preparation, and you allow for the thickness of your restorative material. It's a subtle change. Don't, don't get too aggressive with that change and put a real steep angle in there 
or what are you going to do to your taper overall? Because it will have an effect on resistance and retention. And even though you're maybe very parallel between here and here, if this is a, is a real sloped second plane, you've lost it. So we, we're going to look for where you place it and, and have it be very subtle. It's not, with these typing on teeth, it is not an aggressive angle change. It is a subtle angle change. I would, it was pointed out to me that actually you're, you're struggling more with J-lips with the chamfer diamond than with the rounded shoulder. So I think what's happening is you're probably not using the side of that chamfer diamond enough and you may be approaching your gingival margin you know, point of finish a little bit too soon in the process. So if we were to look at, if we were to turn the type it on upside down like we often look at these and we're gonna look at one of those upper molars preoperatively, many of you have come up to me and said, well, okay, I'm gonna do two plane facial do I line up with this, or this, or somewhere in between? And it's confusing. I can see why you're kind of struggling with that. Because if you line up with this, I mean, that's crazy, and you're gonna to have to put an axial wall like this on the opposite side. So, do this. Line up with simply the axis of the second molar behind it because it's very similar, if not identical, to the tooth you're preparing. Now, the tooth you're preparing, you've already cut the occlusal surface down, you've done your occlusal reduction, but you haven't on the tooth behind it. So, when you start your preparation, just take the handpiece and set it right here and line up with your visual axis. It's going to be just about perpendicular. If you were to draw a line cusp tip to cusp tip, your burr will be perpendicular to that. Then bring your burr right out here and start your preparation with the side of the burr. And frequently go back to your landmarks on the occlusal aspect of the tooth behind it and just keep checking this. And so as you start your preparation, you're creating the axis of that preparation on the buccal axial wall. Forget about the two plane at this point. Just get the axis set up. And you'll end up with something like that. And that will have established the axis for your overall preparation. As you do this, gradually go gingival. So what will happen first is that only the side of your diamond will engage the tooth. And that's okay. Eventually you get to the point where the tip will start to engage the tooth. Make sure that you're doing that occlusal enough that you have room to course correct as you're, as you're kind of zooming in or, or you're you're approaching your axial depth as you get to your supragingival height. You want to do that about the same time, right? So get your axial depth almost finalized. Your gingival margin, you want to get close, but you want it super gingival, right? You want, to, you want to have room to correct errors in case you slip off or, or you J-lip or whatever it is. And as you get close to your axial depth, then focus on finishing that gingival margin right along the buccal aspect. Does that make sense? Does that, so, so you're gonna come, you're gonna come in close to depth and then down a little bit, gingival. As you do that, your axial depth will drop off a little bit because you're coming into this, remember the tooth is kind of coming into itself. It's tapering inward. 
So the more the more apical or gingival you go, the shallower your chamfer will get. Does that make sense to everybody? Can you see that? Because of the contour of the tooth, the more gingival you bring it, because the tooth is belled out, you, you go gingival, gingival, well, you're cutting the chamfer off, and so the chamfer depth decreases. So give yourself enough tooth structure to finish that out. Is everybody clear on that? Once you have your buccal axial wall established, so you've already done, you've already done your non-functional cusp bevel, excuse me, your non-functional cusp occlusal reduction, your functional cusp, and your functional cusp bevel. You've already taken the top of the tooth off. Then you go to the buccal axial wall. Well, once you've got the buccal axial wall, then you go interproximal, and, and try to do that with direct vision. Have the patient get into a position where you can see with your eyes, not through a mirror, and you just go from buccal to lingual. You've already broken contact, and now you're just going to establish that axial wall interproximally. We allow you to be a little bit over tapered because of the shape of those adjacent teeth, but we don't allow you to take too much advantage of that, or you'll really over taper it, right? So stay close to those adjacent teeth. You'll end up just a little bit over tapered, that's okay. And then when you get to the lingual aspect, you simply line up your burr with your buccal axial wall. And you add the lingual axial wall. And then the very final thing you're going to do is come back because it gets a little thin right up here, right? Now you're going to take this burr and you're going to lay it along kind of the inclination of the occlusal two-thirds and then add that two-plane facial reduction. And then, then you'll put your non-functional cusp bevel on. Does that help a little bit? So you're using the side of that diamond to do your initial cutting. You're not lining up on any of those buckle contours at all, they'll, they'll throw you off. You're lining up on the axis of the tooth next to it. Start your preparation in, go to depth, refine the margin, go interproximal, do the lingual, and then two plane facial. It shouldn't be much, it'll be very subtle for most of you and then your non-functional cusp bevel. There could be a few of you that can still be online with the axis of your tooth, and it's enough to the lingual that you don't need to add the two-plane facial. Does that make sense? So if you end up with a tooth that has an axis that's enough lingualized, you may not need the two-plane facial reduction but we'll be able to see it in the preparation, okay? Most of you will have to add that, okay? Any questions? Now, there were several questions right after the last discussion. Remind me if I've missed something in this kind of come together again. Is there anything that we talked about that I'm not covering right now? Got, got yours? Any others, please remind me now because they were excellent questions and I don't, I just think a lot of people probably had the same questions. Can you repeat why some of us don't have to do the two plane? Yeah, so, so again, the two plane, as you can see, it's just this, I'm just taking off that little bit right there. And so if your axis happened to be a little bit more lingual, just the, by the way you lined it up, and this axial wall was over here. So is the whole point of the two plane thing to just get your axis tilted more towards the lingual? No, it, it's more if you end up with, a, so when you add the two plane, let's go back to the original here. When you add that second plane of reduction, When 
you add that second plane of reduction, you're near the end of your preparation and you look down the buckle aspect of all those teeth and this sticks out to you. This looks like, wow, I'm imagining a crown now going over the top of this tube and it's going to be shaped like those teeth next to it and it's really thin right here. It's really prominent. Yeah. So, okay, I've got to do that to it okay. so that it's a uniform thickness of material. Okay. That's why we do the two-plane facial, is just to keep uniform thickness of material all the way around. But if the axis has already done that a little bit, you may not need it. Yeah? So, why did we do that on the mandibular? Is that just because the, the contour of the tooth so of the maxillary is more bell-shaped? It's an excellent question, and on the mandible, you know, you've got, here's your lingual cusp, here's your buccal cusp. On the mandible, you do your occlusal reduction, including the functional cusp bevel, and then you line up your buccal axial wall exactly the same way. You line it up with the overall axis of the tooth, and by the time you do that and then add your non-functional, or yeah, do your, your axial wall and the lingual, your non-functional cusp bevel, the functional cusp bevel takes into account that second, that two-plane facial reduction. And the, it's a great question. The further anterior you go in the mouth, you get into the premolar area, and the functional cusp bevel gets steeper to accommodate for that. But in the molar region, it's exactly the same angle as your non-functional cusp bevel. As you go towards the premolars, it gets steeper. And it does the same thing. And the, lingual, the linguals of those lower molars are so straight, you don't need to do that in two planes. Gotcha. Okay? So those are all really good questions. Uh, yeah? Yes. Does the curve of, how does the curve of Wilson affect our axis in maxillary traps? So it, exactly the same concept, but what happens when you line up with the axis of the tooth, this handpiece is actually going to be sticking out to the buckle a little bit because of the curve of Wilson. And so your upper molars for most people that you're treating, and certainly on your typodonts, the, the uppers are like this, <laughs> and the lowers are like this. <laughs> does, does that make sense? So, so the uppers are going out to the buckle a little bit, and the lowers are coming into the lingual just a little bit, because of the curve of Wilson. So because the functional cusp is on the lingual, you're not, you don't have as big of a bevel. Which is why it's a little bit thinner, and you have to have the two plane on the, on the buckle side. So repeat that one time, I want to make sure I understand it. Because the functional cusp is on the lingual on top. Right, and the functional cusp is on the buckle on the mandible. That's why we don't have to do the two plane because the functional cusp takes out the two plane. Exactly. Okay. The so functional cusp two. bevel on a lower, lower posterior tooth takes into account the contours of the tooth and does the same thing as your two plane facial reduction. And it gets steeper towards the, the anterior. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Any others? Those are all really good questions. Hopefully that clarifies, especially the way you line up your buccal axial wall, because that's the one that lines up the axis of your entire preparation. The side of the burr does the cutting, and keep checking your axis, and as you start to engage the tip of the burr, then start bringing it gingival to get to the right axial depth and gingival height. And you'll get so you arrive at both those at about the same time. Okay, good.